So I'm really curious about this color. This next one is rich green gold. And we've kind of shifted away now from our greens and into kind of this category of like earth pigments and just kind of all these browns and beautiful earth tones. So this color here is in fact a single pigment color. And it does still cut to me have a slight greenish cast to it, but it is beautiful. This one's interesting because there are only three registered paint manu or pigment manufacturers who can make this worldwide. So that's kind of cool. Its number is PY129. And it re this reminds me a little bit of kind of the way that like, I don't know, some of my like kind of quinacridone gold might behave, except for being a little bit more kind of greenish tinted than that one. I don't know if I would buy that one right away because I feel like the playing, I'll see how it dries, honestly. Next up is Nickel Azo Yellow. This one, I saw it in so many mixtures. So as a result of that, I'm really intrigued by this color. And if, they, if there's enough of the color swatch here, I might try to do some more test with it because it's just a really nice kind of gold and yellow. I like it better than that rich green gold. It seems like it could be a really nice color to add. It might even be a nice single pigment alternative to the mix that is now our lovely quinacridone gold. And it really reminds me of that a lot. And that makes sense because quinacridone gold has this color in there. So I very well may, may end up switching up my palette a little bit as a result of this color test right here. And it does go from that beautiful, really nice dark mass tone up here down to that lovely luminescent green, or that kind of goldish color I'm used to with quinacridone gold. Quite impressed by that. Here is a, oh, there's still a bunch of yellow on my brush. <laughs> Here's Bronzite Genuine. It's kind of shiny, hard to agitate off of the page. Another one of those Primatech colors. So far, Sodalite is the only Primatech color I've been impressed with. This one is looking nice and dark and fun on the swatch paper here, but it's just refusing to transfer nicely to my paper over here. So not one that I see myself getting anytime soon. I just don't see the purpose of it. It's like a slightly sparkly one. And I think there's a lot of lovely interference colors up ahead that I could use instead. So not one I see happening anytime soon. This next one is Verona Gold Ochre. And like my yellow ochre on my paper, it is refusing. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I'll let that water sit on there for a minute. And in fact, I'm gonna go through here and drop a little bit of water on all these paints in the hopes that they will take less effort to lift off of the paper if they're already a little bit wet. So hopefully that will make them easier to work with. This one is still proving incredibly difficult to get out of a dry swatch. So not one that I'm likely to really work with. It's just <laughs> being kind of a pain in the butt. So Verona Gold Ochre from Daniel Smith is not one that I'll be getting. You can just see it's just not cooperating very well for me. Moving on. Okay, here's one finally that's lifting off a little bit better. Burnt Bronzite Genuine. So it's working a little bit easier to agitate from that paper than the other bronzite color. It's kind of a, you know, it's burnt. So when they heat pigments, it will change the color of them. This one is, looks just a lot like a sienna, but with sparkles. So burnt bronzite equals sparkly sienna. Not necessary for my palette personally. Next up is French Ochre. And these ochre colors that we've seen so far, Verona Gold Ochre, French Ochre, then the raw sienna, the burgundy, the next like five colors all share the same or very close to the same pigment numbers. And that's interesting because originally chemically, the colors PY42 and PY43 were pretty much identical chemically, but because of the scarcity of the actual earth pigments and how much cheaper it is to make them synthesized, most of the, pretty much all the paints now that we get that have that designation of PY43 or 42, they're synthetic pigments. And they can exist in so many different colors of yellows, oranges, and browns. But we just have to make sure that we're keeping our mind that they're synthetic iron oxide pigments, not natural ones. The same goes for some of the PBR7s, which is some of the brown colors that we get later. So just something to keep in mind that these are actually not anymore <laughs> going to be ground up earth pigments. Um, that was kind of a new thing that I learned in diving into all of this was that how often those traditional pigments are made synthetically now. Next up, we have raw sienna light. 
This one is at least agitating from the paper a little bit easier. Same pigment number, or this is PY42, so very similar um, chemical composition to that PY43. This one is so far my favorite of the bunch. It's kind of a nice, like, it's a little bit more yellowish tone, so I'm enjoying that, but eh. <laughs> it's not, it's nothing too special. Um, I do like it better than the yellow ochre I currently have. Burgundy yellow ochre. Okay, putting a drop of water on these helped so much to make them easier to wet from the paper. That was a really smart decision. <laughs> Made it a lot easier, a lot less paintbrush scrubbing across the paper. So that's been a nice improvement. And then something else I read about too was that these pigments are often made for just like other manufacturing processes. So the pigment manufacturers use them in wood or leather stains, then plastic making, ceramic and masonry. So that's one of the reasons why we have such a wide range of colors is because these other bigger industries need these colors more than artists do. So they need much bigger quantities, which directs and kind of informs the way that those big manufacturers will work. Here is our lovely yellow ochre, and it looks similar to the raw sienna, just slightly more orange. Of the things we've seen so far, it's definitely the best one yet. It has a higher color concentration. So many of these were just so light, they refuse to re-wet. They probably work a lot better when, it, like, if we were able to use them straight from the tube, but because so often I'm working in the field, I don't have that luxury. So it's useful for me to see how finicky some of these can be in terms of re-wetting. Ah, finally, here is one that is re-wetting quite nicely. This is Mars Yellow. This is another variant of those same synthetic pigments, PY42, but who knows what it's made out of. <laughs> I think if I had known about this color, I would have probably replaced my yellow ochre with Mars Yellow because it's just so much more saturated and much more opaque. So I'm able to get a better kind of, you know, a better coverage for a similar looking color. But yellow ochre was useful in the desert just for kind of giving a really nice earthy tone to some stuff. So I am undecided as of yet. So here's our first PBR7. Once again, just a reminder that these are likely synthetic pigments now. They're not going to be ground up earthy stuff. <laughs> That's just too, you know, too rare. And most of them got most of the natural deposits were used up as far as I could learn anyway. So here's raw sienna. This is quite a nice color. It's kind of a nice earthy, well, earthy. <laughs> earthy because they used to be made from the earth, but kind of like a nice, like you'd see that in like somewhere in the desert and, and that kind of thing. So an interesting color, not something that I would necessarily run to go get right now, but I do like it. I think I like it better than the Mars yellow. So that's really pretty. I'm enjoying that one so far. Up next is quinacridone gold. This is one of my absolute favorite pigments. And the interesting thing is, is that when I first started using this pigment about 10 years ago, it was a single pigment color. Um, but unfortunately, I think it was about five years ago, maybe six, this color, they ran out because this color was no longer in favor with the bigger industries like the dyeing or the car manufacturers or plastic manufacturers. So as a result, Daniel Smith, you know, they bought up as much as they could. And then once that was gone, now when you buy quinacridone gold, it's a mix of nickel azo yellow plus a quinacridone burnt orange, which thankfully is still being made in enough quantities that we can still find it and use it. Um, I'm tempted to go buy some backup quinacridone orange jars after the experience with the quinacridone gold. It still performs very similar. Like I can't tell too much of a difference, but you can, it's fun to see nickel azo yellow and just like how you can see that they added that, that brown, you know, that kind of brownie orange color to it to make that new color. But it is one of my favorites. This one in mixtures, do be aware though, that it does tend toward the very much greenish side of things. So if you're using it to make like in a sky, I would tend toward a different yellow than this one because it does make greens so very readily. Up next is transparent yellow oxide. So this is going to be a, just another kind of oxide pigment, um, probably synthesized. So here is going to be this guy, very similar to some of the other colors we've seen. Um, I've, I have heard thing, good things about though, about the transparent yellow and kind of orange or red iron oxides. And I can see why they're much more concentrated than the kind of the siennas or the ochres. So I think I would probably start leaning in that direction maybe more. 
and I'm going to put some little water droplets down again so I can try to encourage these colors to <laughs> be easier to work with. And I can go down to burnt yellow ochre. Okay. So next I was Monte Amiata Natural Sienna. Interesting. So the first thing I notice is that this color was much easier to agitate from the paper than some of the other colors we've seen. This color is what I hoped my yellow ochre would be, honestly. And I've heard from a couple of students that they really, really like this color. So I am not surprised. It's beautiful. It looks like it will have some granulation properties. So very intrigued by this color. I will likely be getting it to try out. Um, maybe it's a nice addition and it, you know, I might keep the yellow ochre for desert stuff, but this one is a really pretty compliment and kind of nice addition to that, I think. Hematite, oh, here we go with another one of our Primatech colors. That one, the Primatech colors just don't seem to go as far either. They kind of get, you know, lifted off of the night. There's nothing left. <laughs> so eh, nothing special here in my opinion. I mean, I'm an opinionated artist. <laughs> So you're going to get, if, I, if I, something's not that exciting to me, I'm just going to move on. This is environmentally friendly yellow, ooh, yellow iron oxide. This is cool. This is, I think, kind of what I wish my burnt sienna from Daniel Smith looked like. It's just this really nice, vibrant orangey red color. It, and it's environmentally friendly, which supposedly means that they use a process of extracting this color from mine tailings. So it's iron oxide recovery is the term for the process and it removes these colors from the water from mines, which is actually really great because it's a huge problem in a bunch of places in the States and throughout the world that when they mine, you have all this orange stuff that gets stuck in the water. And there's some awesome companies and organizations working to recover that and try to bring the water back to a more natural and safer state. So here's a geothite brown ochre. This one, <laughs> it's almost no paint. It's like falling off the paper. How funny. Um, meh. It's just a meh. It doesn't rise to any level of excitement for me. So nothing special there. Thin down, also nothing special. And then here's quinacridone deep gold, which is just the same exact mixture of quinacridone gold but just with, I bet, more of that quinacridone burnt orange. And it just looks a lot like burnt orange with some yellow mixed in, which it is. It's just quinacridone burnt orange with some a little bit of nickel azo yellow. So definitely would not need this color. I already have one of the two components they're using, so not necessary to go buy this right away. And for our last three colors on this page, we have Italian deep ochre. This is another one of those PUI 43s. So once I see that pigment number, I just expect it to not be as dark and saturated as what I see in some of my other, like, like this one, that, that those iron oxides are really beautiful so far, but this one, a lot of the ochres, I'm just not very impressed with. They're pretty light. And for what I want to paint with, like having to agitate them that hard out of my palette would just be kind of annoying in the long run. So don't think I'll be using that one. Up next is Lunar Earth. And this one's kind of cool because let's see. It's just going to be, ooh, it looks a lot like a color that I see, we'll see in a little bit called Indian Red. A little note about Indian Red. I did some reading and it's named Indian Red after where that pigment was first found in India. So the name, in fact, has nothing to do with indigenous populations in, the, in America, but I still wish they could find a different name. But Lunar Earth is pretty. It's going to be super high granulating. So if I try to make a little bit more watered down color swatch, we can hopefully see that granulation in action as it dries. I have a lunar black that's really, really gorgeous. So I don't think I would need that one necessarily, but ooh, look, it's doing it already. It's so pretty. <laughs> that is insane. That happened so fast. Oh my gosh. It's fun to see how some of these are more granulating than other ones. Like that iron oxide over here is going to be granulating a little bit as well, which is cool to see. And the last one for this page is our burnt yellow. Ooh, this is kind of a nice reddish tone. This burnt yellow ochre. I'm very surprised by this color. So this is going to be PY or PR 101 or 102. And just like our PY 42 and 43, these two colors can exist in a lot of different shades and from yellows to browns and reds. But um, these are also likely going to be synthetic pigments. And then when you heat them, it opens up a whole different layer of different color options. Although I will have to look that up to see if they're synthetic or not. Um, 
So don't hold me to that one. I'm going to do some more research as we move into more of these colors. But this one is really cool. I'm really enjoying this color. It's a warm tone. It's like lovely, just kind of mid-toned reddish earth pigment. Look at that lunar earth. Look at that thing go. That's insane. So, so far a lot of similar stuff on this page. Um, <laughs> I have my favorite here. I'm tempted to get some Monte Amiata Natural Sienna. I've also heard from students that this color works really well as a tint for yellow skies because it tends not to mix much with the blue, so you get less of that kind of green mixing in the sky. Okay, so upon further investigation, I found some useful information, and that is that PR102, which is what burnt yellow ochre is from, is the natural variation of red iron oxide. However, paints that you see PR101 as a synthetic red iron oxide, and interestingly enough, that synthetic one can then be changed and made into eight different shades of color. So I um, thought that was really interesting, and I'm going to keep an eye out for that. I honestly don't know enough about the chemical processes of, like, you know, does it really make that big of a difference to be synthetic versus natural? Um, I don't think I have much of a preference as long as they perform similarly, so I would definitely have to do some more reading. It's beyond the scope of this video series here, but I definitely want to do some more reading to better understand you know, what what the differences are there, if any, that would be impactful for us as artists. Continuing on with our browns now, we have Garnet Genuine. Like the rest of the Prima text, it doesn't want to lift off of the paper very well, but it is a really pretty color. And look at that, it's definitely different from what else we've seen, and I'm enjoying that color compared to some of the other ones, so kind of fun, would I get it? No. And we'll be able to move through the browns somewhat more quickly than some of the other ones just because there is less kind of pigment details to be sharing. So there's that Garnet Genuine. Then here is our Roasted French Ochre. And this one is PR102, which means that it's the natural form of the red iron oxide. So I can get a nice little swatch of that. And the one kind of like summary statement I found that was useful for this was from the Jackson's art blog. And it was saying that in general, synthetic iron oxides tend to be highly saturated and cleaner. So we haven't gone to a synthetic one yet. And they all, so the cleaner, cleaner in color means they're less kind of muddy looking. So natural iron oxides tend to be less saturated and a little bit, little bit more muddy in their appearance. And that, because they can have natural impurities in them. Um, also, generally speaking, the synthetics have a smaller pigment size and then the naturals like this have a bigger pigment size. So that was interesting to me. But the same um, blog also said that, you know, we take those recommend those kind of generalities with a grain of salt because across pigments, there can be so much difference in terms of what they are that it doesn't make, you know, it's useful to have a general idea of how they behave, but we can't lend too much, you know, exclusive credence just to that generality. So here is another natural pigment right here. So this is burgundy red ochre. It looks a lot like the burnt sienna that I have <laughs> from Daniel Smith, so that's interesting. It doesn't want to thin down too readily, but there it goes. Kind of a fun, interesting color. Let's see what's next. Next, oh, next it was Indian Red. So this is one of our first, like, of the really highly synthetic ones. And you can see right away, this is a fully opaque color. It's incredibly highly saturated. This thing has the consistency for watercolor of, like, a house paint. <laughs> It's crazy and it granulates and it's beautiful and I love this color so much. I've had it for quite a while. Just a reminder that that term Indian red refers to when these pigments were originally mined from the earth, they were found in India and doesn't refer to the indigenous populations in other parts of the world or in the United States. And this next one is also a synthetic red and you can tell right away it has that same just kind of stunning crazy opacity. It's a slightly more yellow tone than that Indian red. So Indian red tends more toward purple. This one is tending more toward yellow or the oranges. It's also very granulating. I don't have that color, but now I'm kind of tempted to. It's beautiful. It's just kind of a little bit more luminous in some in the yellow spectrum than our Indian red. So that's a synthetic one as well. Then we switch to a natural earth pigment next, which is the Italian burnt sienna. And it's funny as I can tell right away now, like these natural pigments are harder to lift off of the paper so far. So that's interesting. And Italian burnt sienna, there we go. There's the dark color, not, not the most concentrated color, that's for sure. Kind of a nice mid-tone brown. <laughs> Nothing too special about that one. 
This next color, however, is one that we've seen, we've heard the name said quite a bit. This is quinacridone burnt orange, P048 is our pigment number. And this one we've seen in a lot of our green mixtures so far. It's a pigment I've had for a little while now. It's my favorite orange that I have so far. It feels like a really nice, natural, and earthy color orange. So I have a ton of fun with it. It's beautiful in mixtures. It's great for the desert. It can make some beautiful greens. It will dry, just so you know, a little bit kind of more dull than how it initially appears in kind of its you know, wet form like this. So that's something to be aware of. And also if you have a bigger color swatch, you can get it to be a darker orange than what you see there. So this small swatch, let's just see if I can get a darker color for everybody. <laughs> it's not working super well here. So let's take a look at, here we go. Here's that quinacridone burnt orange. If I really run that brush through it, there we go. <laughs> now we're getting a darker color. So that's definitely a limitation of the little teeny tiny dot samples is that it's hard for some of these colors to get them at their full concentration like that, which is useful to see for a color that I like that much. Next up we have quinacridone sienna. This is a mixture and you can kind of take, you can kind of guess what it's a mixture of. It's a mixture of the color right before it, that quinacridone burnt orange plus a yellow. So it's nickel azo yellow. And there it is. I like that. It's a beautiful, like very, very bright orange. I'm going to make a note of that mixture. So if I end up getting some nickel azo yellow, I can try that because it seems to work really well with that quinacridone burnt orange. And by adding that yellow, you can see how it took it from kind of a more brownish side to a more you know, typical orange in the middle of that color spectrum. Up next is Pompeii Red. <laughs> Just, you know, another, another earth pigment. Um, nothing too exceptional in my opinion about this one. Not something I'm going to go pick up right away. I don't, I, I tend to have a very limited number of kind of the brown earth pigments because otherwise it gets overwhelming to know what I should use. So I try to keep my assortment pretty minimal. Here's red fuchsite. They gave me almost none of this color. So I'm having a hard time getting enough of it to even see what it looks like. There it goes. <laughs> uh, a Primatech, not, the, not my most favorite. You can't really even tell what's happening there. I'll try to rinse the brush and get the last little bit of that off. Oh, come on. It's just not going any, any darker on my paper. I don't have a big enough sample, unfortunately. Minnesota Pipestone is another Primatech color. So here we go. Also doesn't want to lift off the paper. Looks similar to that red fuchsite, but just is able to cover a little bit better. To be honest, I have not been very in, like inspired <laughs> by most of the Primatech colors. They just don't seem to be as useful as many of the other colors in Daniel Smith's lineup. So, and here's another one, Sedona Genuine. All right, this one at least is lifting off of the paper better. <laughs> um, some of them were so unimpressive how they just would not come off of that little dot. So, but this one is like, it looks similar to some of the other, like the burgundy red ochre or, or even that Italian burnt sienna. Oops, and I forgot to do our light colored Pompeii red. There we go. Let's try to get a light colored Sedona Genuine. Also not that exciting to me. <laughs> Here's our Italian Venetian red. This one is a PR 101, so a synthetic red oxide. For a synthetic, it's proving very difficult to get off of that paper. Come on. I mean, I can barely even get this color to show up from that tiny sample. So I do wish that Daniel Smith took that into account that like you can see it better here on the little blotting paper, but as soon as I try to transfer that thing, it's just getting too watered down and we can barely see it. I'm going to try putting, so next up is English Red Earth, a different pigment in that same area, really having to agitate this one. And it's ending up very similar to the Italian Venetian Red. Just does not, I'm going to give that one some time, see if I can get it as it gets more wet to be able to get a little bit stronger and darker. So I'll come back to that one. Next up is Quinacridone Burnt Scarlet. This is a single pigment color in the Quinacridone. So we're back to having a nice luminous color that actually lifts off the paper. That's awesome. Woohoo, that's kind of a fun color to see. Look at that. I like that. That's a really beautiful kind of reddish color. I don't know if I would go get one right away, but and again, they did not give me a big enough sample of that one to be able to really see what that color looks like at its full kind of concentration or strength. And let's try to go back to that English red earth, see if I can get a little bit more of that off. There we go. Not much, but it's a little bit better. They need bigger samples to make these truly more useful. 
I'm very intrigued by our next color. This is Perlene, ooh, Perlene Maroon. So I wish this had been in our main reds lineup, so I'm not sure why they put it here, to be honest. The arrangement of colors here just does not make much sense to me. This really feels like it should have been with the other reds. It's beautiful. It's a very kind of whiny color, a wine tone color. Even with a tiny little dot, I mean, I'm able to get a really nice dark color, so that's kind of neat. Even, and it also thins down beautifully, so I'm really curious to see how that one ends up drying. Up next is Deep Scarlet. This is a semi-opaque color. Um, and it looks like a scarlet. It's light fastness one. So if I wanted a really nice semi-opaque color, then I would try this one. But I think I like some of my other reds better. And I feel like I can mix this red by adding just a little bit, tiny bit of yellow to the reds I already have. So don't think I'll be getting that one. But it is cool. And I'm, it'll be fun to see over time. So I don't want to buy too many paints right off the bat, but it will be really cool over time to kind of get to assess just like which ones I want to get in and add to my collection over time. And the next one is Naphthamide Maroon. I didn't have any special notes about, ooh, about this one. It looks like kind of like that quinacridone or like one of our really dark quinacridone violets. It kind of reminds me a bit of that. This thing is cool. <laughs> this is a really neat color. Again, I wish this was with, with the purples because I think it really should have been there. So we'll see. I may end up moving things around. <laughs> if it makes more sense to have some of these in other spaces, I might end up putting them there. Like these all feel like really luminous reds that really should be with that other red section, but we'll see. And then I want to make a light swatch of that. I'm going to be so curious to see how these three dry. So far, they're some of the prettiest ones I've seen, and I'm really excited to see that. Okay, next up is going to be Lunar Red Rock. All right. Ooh, it looks kind of, it looks a lot like Indian Red, honestly. It looks like a more purpley version of Indian Red. Um, it's also semi-opaque instead of fully opaque. So I guess if you wanted a Indian Red that wasn't as opaque as the other one, this could be a good alternative for you. And if you wanted a tiny bit more purple one, that could be a good one as well. I mean, I don't even want to bother <laughs> with these next two. They're both Primatec colors. I'm going to try to pre-wet them. Tiger's Eye, they gave me like none of that paint. And I already had some, it's like, so it's just kind of like a brownish color. <laughs> That's kind of lame, honestly. Like there's so little paint on there. I can't even get an idea of what that color was. So continue to be unimpressed by the Primatex. Piemont, P -P -P Piemontite, Piemontite Genuine. This one at least is lifting off the paper. Um, I think if you can get a better idea for some of the premium text of how they look over here on this piece of paper, because this kind of really absorbent paper is going to take most of the pigment from that little swatch. But I'm still moving them just to kind of see how they look more thinned out. So PM and type, also not that exciting to me, but it's good to see. And I'm excited to continue on with our color swatches here now with the lovely browns and blacks and kind of earth tone reds. And I'll also note that on the recommendation of a lovely person from YouTube, I did put a little drop of water on some of these color dots to help kind of lift them off of the page. So I bet that will help make a big difference for some of the ones that don't want to lift off as easily. So to kick things off, we have Burnt Tiger's Eye Genuine. So I'm going to swatch a little bit of this guy here. And again, as usual, I'll do kind of the darker swatch to start and then a more light swatch as I go along. And just, I think, like with the other... Tiger's Eye that I found, this one does, it is very hard, even with that little bit of extra pre-wetting, to get a really dark version of this color. I just don't quite have enough of it in my dot. So I do wish that there was a bit more <laughs> paint on that page, as you can see that when I actually take it from the page over here onto my other piece of paper, it is quite hard to get a dark color. So that one might be really spectacular when you have it out of a tube, but I just can't quite get it to lift off very well from there. So now we're moving on to, I'm assuming this is hematite genuine. It's a little bit covered up by the dot of color there, but it's going to be likely a granulating color. It's got a little bit of shine possibly in there. So I'll put a little, a little bit of that one down. Same thing, I'm finding that this one is kind of hard to get off of my little swatch. I've kind of used pretty much all of the color there, <laughs> and I really can't get it to be very dark. I've heard from some artists that they do really, really like this color. It's kind of a nice grayish brownish color, but I'm just finding that I'm having 
a hard time getting it to kind of a higher concentration. And I was scrubbing to the best of my ability to the point where I did, did even get some little uh, pieces of paper <laughs> that I took off of this one accidentally stuck on that one. <laughs> so now we have a German granulating raw umber. So this one's lifting off, oop, <laughs> a little piece of it actually broke off. So this one's lifting off a bit easier. So I'll put some of this here. That's an interesting looking color. It's kind of a, you know, it's very similar to the other raw umbers I've played with. So it's going to be kind of leaning more toward yellow than the reds. And this one's also just a, it's PBR7 is the base color. And that means it's a natural brown iron oxide. So a lot of these colors you'll kind of hear over and over again the same color names. And that happens because the same kind of constituent color names like PBR and PY101, etc. And that happens because these different pigments, either the synthetic or the natural version like this, through different variations of that pigment, whether it has more or less iron, or if they actually give that pigment a different kind of treatment, and especially with heat treatment, then that will change the appearance of the color, which is really cool. And I am not a chemist, so I don't really <laughs> know enough about those amazing processes to really be able to give an educated account of them. But just know that, that when you hear a couple times like PBR7 over and over again, the reason that we can get a bunch of different colors out of it is that it is treated differently on the processing side. So here's hematite violet genuine, again, like the other kind of, you know, more like kind of brownish Prematex, having a hard time getting that one just kind of off of this. They, these, I've heard they're amazing sometimes, they just don't perform very well off of the dot card. So now here is Mummy Bauxite, which is another Primatech color. So this one appears to be the lovely exception, but as a Primatech color, it did just really lift off of that lovely little dot card so beautifully. So that one had absolutely no trouble. <laughs> and it's a really interesting brown and I'll be kind of a nice reddish brown. I'll be curious to compare it to the other kind of browns that we get to play with as we go along. Next up is going to be permanent brown. And this is, if I look over at my little sheet and I just kind of have this handy here, that's going to be the little sheet that came with the dot cards. It's all the little kind of pigment information about them. This is permanent brown PBR 25. And ooh, this is a really interesting color. So it's going to be quite a transparent color. Ooh, look at that. Okay, so I'm really intrigued by this one. And I am going to be kind of watching this one with some excitement to see how it ends up drying. Like, will it dry more dull or more vibrant? Because if it stays kind of in this space right here, that could be a really lovely addition for my Southwest palette. So cautiously excited about that one. And I'll also note that a lot of these earth pigments have really excellent light fastness. So they're pretty much all, at least the ones on this page, they're all light fastness of one. So they're really, really stable pigments, which is quite nice to work with. Okay, up next is raw umber violet, and this is a mixture. So this is going to be that PBR7, that, that brown iron oxide, combined with quinacridone violet. So that makes sense. This one does have a very kind of distinct appearance of having that violet in there. And honestly, it looks a lot like, well, it's kind of like per, that, that perline maroon color which I ended up buying and I've been really loving, by the way. So Pearly Maroon has been a truly wonderful addition to a lot of my color palettes recently. So that one, I don't think I would buy that specific color out of the tube because it is a mixture and I could just buy the PBR7 pigment and then go from there. So for now, I think I will skip that one, but it is really pretty. It's a really nice color and I'm, but I'm still very intrigued by this guy, that permanent brown. <laughs> it's looking really pretty. So here's transparent brown oxide. Ooh, look at that. So the one I swatched right here is transparent brown oxide. And I paused the recording there for a minute so I could just make sure that I got the pigment numbers correct for this one, because this is one of those really interesting illustrations of how you can have the same number, PR101, and you can do this color right there. And then you can also do a transparent red oxide. Whoa, look at that, that's crazy. <laughs> So these are both going to be the same base pigment, PR101. Then it's just going to be treat, given different treatments or kind of the processing of how they work with it in the lab is going to be different. And that's what allows it to have such a huge variation in, in appearance 
And this one can also go even more reddish or even slightly purplish. And this is a synthetic version of red iron oxide. So you can have a natural version of it. And iron oxide is basically just rust. And there's a couple different versions of iron oxide depending on the chemical makeup of it. But for us as artists, the interesting thing to know is it's the same pigment and it's just given different treatments in terms of heat and other stuff that I didn't fully understand and didn't want to articulate incorrectly for our group. So very fun to see those two. Super interesting. That one's like such a crazy color. And they literally use this pigment to color bricks. <laughs> so if that color looks familiar, that is why. So then we have next is fire gold ochre. And fired, I, the name implies that it's been, has had some heat applied to it. So I'm kind of, this one's not lifting off super great, even with a little bit of help of an extra dot of water. This one's going to be a natural red iron oxide. So it's going to be PR102. That's the natural variation. And again, there just wasn't quite enough color on my dot card for me to get a really full, I think, illustration of how that color appears. I do wish the dots were a little bit bigger because I think that it would be fun to be able to have a little bit more paint to play with. But you can see that even the amount that was left in this really absorbent paper also just isn't that dark. So that color must just not have a very dark and saturated mass tone compared to the other ones. So now we come to Burnt Sienna Light. And this is a very interesting color to me because it's just, it's a mixture. So it's PR101, that synthetic iron oxide. And it also has in it a bit of our quinacridone burnt orange, which is that P048. So that's going to help give it that more kind of orangish appearance that you see here. And again, com I, compared to most of the mixtures, I don't think I'd buy this one <laughs> because as I have explained, in the, if you've been watching <laughs> these prior videos, I'm a big fan of having as much as possible, just the base colors, the single pigment colors, and then being able to mix them from there with a couple of key exceptions in my palette, like New Gambo, which is one of my favorite mixtures, as is Quinacridone Gold. But that one is quite pretty, but I feel like I could be able to, I could make that color on my own just by mixing some of the things that I already have. And that's totally personal preference too, right? I mean, some artists love to have a bunch of pre-mixtures. I kind of personally lean toward the side of wanting to have just some of the, as much like fun and mystery, mysterious variation as possible. This next color is going to be an environmentally friendly red iron oxide. And I think that that means just that they use a process of, you know, depending on the manufacturer, Environmentally friendly can mean that it's um, just either you know, created or made in a way that is kind of lower consumption in terms of sustainability. Or for some paint makers, that, that might actually mean that they're also kind of repurposing mine tailings. I am not 100% sure on what Daniel Smith means by the environmentally friendly component, so I will leave that to others to go and research on your own. Likely from their website, they probably have some of that information too. I just forgot to check that one before I started up our video. All right, and we're now back up and running with the bottom part of our page visible. Here is our Burnt Sienna. This is another variation of our PBR7, <laughs> which is incredible. Just blows my mind a little bit every time I see that same number there. And I have this version of Burnt Sienna. And according to some of my friends and students, Burnt Sienna from different manufacturers will have a pretty big variation in how it appears in terms of the mass tone. So the Daniel Smith one is gonna be a lot kind of lighter color. It's a much more kind of gentle reddish orange earth tone. And then I've heard from others that they, they, they kind of choose the one that they want based on how they want that to appear. Um, but I, I like the Burnt Sienna. It's just a really kind of more gentle version. And I also have Indian Red if I really want a super saturating one. So I kind of enjoy that. Next up is going to be English red ochre. This is going to be PR101, so synthetic red iron oxide. And let's see here. It looks very similar to the burnt sienna, especially at the, based on the amount of color that I was able to get off of the little dot over there. Maybe a teeny bit more yellowish based on what I can see over here, but overall very, very similar. <laughs> so those seem pretty similar pigments. Next up is burnt umber, woohoo. That's gonna be kind of fun. So I have burnt umber in my palette and I don't use it a ton just because I really love mixing my own browns. And I'm actually gonna grab my burnt umber and just use some of that so we can get this at a more full concentration here. So it's sticking to the bottom of my palette. There we go. <laughs> 
So I'm just going to grab some of the burnt umber off of my palette. Just got to find it. And here we go. So you can see how when I have more of that paint like in my palette here, it is much easier to get a much more dark variation. So this right here is why I do wish that we were provided with a bit more paint from Daniel Smith in those color swatches because I really anticipate that I'm not able to get a lot of those browns into their full mass tones just because I don't have enough paint available to me. So Daniel Smith, if you see this, please make those dots maybe twice as big, <laughs> especially for the earth tones because a little bit does not go a super long way with these. So having that actual color in my palette to show you is really helpful. We can just see how lovely and dark that gets. Interestingly enough, this is also PBR7. So you can compare Burnt Sienna, PBR7, this Burnt Umber, PBR7, <laughs> which is just totally crazy. So I need to switch pages here. And while I'm sitting here, I'm also going to apply just a little dot of water to a lot of these different colors in here because I do want to encourage them to lift off the paper a little bit easier. So let's see here, there we go, there we go go through most of those colors. Okay, so back to our environmentally friendly. Now it's lifting off. So just see how it took a minute for that water to kind of soak in and soften that. So here is our environmentally friendly brown iron oxide. And I do love how we can see that really dark kind of more mass tone off to the right over here. So that's going to be a more kind of more, I feel like it's a little bit more of a neutral brown to me than the burnt umber, which is leaning more toward the kind of you know, orange side, this is leaning a little bit more toward the middle of the color spectrum to me. Up next is going to be raw umber. And I don't have this color, but a number of my students right now have been really enjoying working with raw umber. So it may be something that I'll have to get a little bit to try out. Um, again, I think because of just the not coming off that swatch super fast, it's going to be a little bit lighter in appearance on my page over here than how it could work out of the out of the tube, but it's a really interesting color. This one kind of leans more toward the greenish side. <laughs> so this one's gonna be kind of, you know, a whole different little ball game on its own. And I do like that even though this paper over here does kind of pill and let some little chunkies out of it that got stuck in some of my colors, it is helpful that it, it does absorb so much of that paint so we can see a more dark version over there. All right, so here's sepia, and sepia is a mixture of colors. This one's going to be our PBR7, so probably it looks a lot like raw umber plus some bone black. So it's just going to be a darker version of the color that we just saw, and that makes sense. It just has some black thrown in. So there's that, and then thinned out. I'm curious about this one. Ooh, that has a really pretty quality, and it's a little bit more thinned out across the page, so I enjoy that one. Now here is another Prima Tech Genuine color. This is going to be Cyclorite Genuine. So kind of a very similar brown color to the two that we've already done. Just a little bit more pale and in comparison. <laughs> and I'll do a little bit more light version of that as well. So there's that one. Then over here we have Van Dyke Brown, which is going to be PBR7. So I'm going to grab a little bit of that. And that's interesting. I'm just going to double check. Yeah, so this is really interesting. So on the Daniel Smith page, they literally describe this one as a blend of PBR7. <laughs> All right, so they, Daniel Smith lists this as a blend of PBR7s. So I'm not exactly sure what that means, but based on my understanding of how that pigment can be treated to appear differently, I'm going to assume that that means that this is just a bunch of different or who knows how many different variations <laughs> of PBR7 with different treatments combined together to get that really interesting brown. So I guess it's a sing single pigment color, <laughs> but a single pigment with just different variants of it, which is really interesting and kind of fun to me. Up next is going to be Bloodstone Genuine. Ooh, I have a feeling this one could be a really interesting color, especially as it settles, because the one really magical thing that I see with the Primatek colors is that they do just like settle and move across the page so, so beautifully. And it was in fact inspired by playing with these swatches here that I ended up getting the sodalite color and I loved it. It's been such a wonderful addition to my color palette, especially when I was in the desert and the painted, uh, painted desert in um, Arizona at Petrified Forest National Park. 
So that granulation just creates some effects that I really can't make any way else. Um, so I'm really enjoying those. So while this dries a little bit, we can kind of take a tour back through some of the pigments that have dried. So we'll go back up here and look at how that burnt tiger's eye settled out really beautifully. The hematite violet, I think, settled out the prettiest in terms of getting both kind of an orangish, slightly pinkish tone, along with the kind of more little bit kind of silvery gray chunks in there. And that hematite was also kind of silvery. The raw umber violet is still staying a really interesting color. But again, I think at lower concentrations, my pearly maroon looks a lot like that one. Permanent brown, I'm still very intrigued by that one. <laughs> like, I... I don't know if I'll add it, but I do, I think what I'm going to do is play around with some of my mixtures to see if I can get close to that one. And if I can't, then I'll buy it. And that's kind of been my benchmark so far, whether I want to get a color or not, has been, can I mix that color or not? <laughs> and if I can't mix it, then I go and get it and have fun playing with it. We're now continuing on to the full kind of dark and black colors. Next up is Lunar Violet. This is a mixture of Mars Black plus ultramarine violet. So it's going to be a slight purple hued or kind of slight purple leaning version of our black. And it's quite pretty. I bet it's also going to have some lovely granulation. And I would expect also some interesting separation of that color as it does kind of dry and settle on the paper. So I'm excited to watch that one. And let's see, up, 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 up next is one of my absolute favorites. Neutral tint I have had forever. And one of the reasons I love this color is that a little bit goes a long way and it re-wets just so beautifully. You can see with just a little swipe of my paintbrush across that color. We got such a nice, dark, huge amount of pigment on my paintbrush. So I adore new neutral tint. <laughs> and it's a mixture. It's quinacridone violet, phthalo blue, and carbon black. And carbon black within Daniel Smith's nomenclature is just a lamp black if you look at the pigment numbers. So I use neutral tint so, so much. It is my absolute go-to pigment when I'm working with a monochromatic painting. And because of that lovely, gentle mixture of the violet, the blue, and the black, it really does also, it mixes pretty well. It doesn't get too muddy, like, like any mixture it can. But I find that, you know, if I'm going to have a mixture on the palette, that's the one I'm always going to have. <laughs> I love it. It's just such a, it's gorgeous and it makes so many wonderful variations with just a tiny bit of additions to it. And it also has just such a deep, deep, dark, wonderful mass tone, even a t tiny bit darker than that. That just really goes such a long way. And I use it in so many of my mountain paintings as well. Next up is graphite gray and <laughs> it's such a fun color. It's so cool. It's very opaque looking and I think it's probably just graphite, I would bet, like ground up graphite, which is amazing. So that kind of blows my mind. I can look at my little cheat sheet here to figure out what number it is to go all the way over here. It's PBK10, so a new number we haven't seen yet. And it just moves and disperses so interestingly across the page when I was like, it's you can see just a little granular pig pieces of the paint in there. So that's also one I'm really curious to keep my eye on just as it continues to dry on my page. It's such an interesting color. <laughs> it's also interesting to see them side by side with the graphite gray here, the neutral tint here. With those two side by side, you can really see that little bit of blue and kind of very gentle purplish kind of cast to our neutral tint. Up next is our Payne's Blue Gray, which is going to be carbon black and Indian Throne Blue. So, ooh, this is pretty. I'm feeling like I might need to get some carbon black now. <laughs> it's been in a lot of these different mixtures and I just, I, I haven't had a, a bl good black for a while. I've just been relying on having my neutral tint, but I really do love the way that this sits and kind of moves across the page. Wow, that's really, really pretty. Our next black color is going to be a Payne's Gray. This is going to be a mixture of ultramarine plus bone black, so a different black. And of the two, these are the Payne's gray and then the Payne's blue gray. I think I am, le I don't know, they're both really pretty. Now, I, yeah, like I said, I really want to add some more blacks to my, my palette now. <laughs> so I've had lunar black forever, but it granulates so much that I just find that I don't use it that much. So it might be time to add another lovely one of the blacks to my palette. I'll have to do some more experimentation 
in reading about those two. The Payne's blue gray definitely is leaning more toward the kind of yellow or green side. And this one makes the ultramarine is going to be leaning more toward that kind of warmer purplish ultramarine blue. So as I mentioned earlier, lamp black is PBK6, which some people will li list as carbon black. And I use this pigment a fair bit when I'm working in acrylics, so it's fun to see it here. And I can also see by just looking at this color, you know, how it could be mixed with Indian throne blue to kind of get that really kind of more almost yellowish greenish appearance, because that one does kind of lean more toward the yellowy browny side. And here is another Primatech. This is black tourmaline genuine. Ooh, I'm very, I bet this one will also granulate really interestingly. It's got like a little bit of brown in there and a little bit of green in there. So super curious about that one. <laughs> I'll be keeping an eye on that one on the page as it moves around. There's that little guy. And then ivory black. This is going to be a different pigment number, I believe. So if we look at ivory black, that's PBK9. And this one feels even more kind of brownish compared to our lamp black. And you can pretty clearly see that when we get it on the page. It definitely, if you were to line them up from least brownish to most brownish, this one would be by far on the most brownish side. So there's that little buddy of color there. And I got a big, big chunk in there. <laughs> there it goes. And our last black is going to be lunar black. So this one again, this one that you can tell right away just by how my paintbrush is moving through it. It does re-wet really easily from a dry palette, which is one reason why I've been using it before. So it's kind of an interesting pigment. It also granulates like crazy, <laughs> which is awesome. It does just, and I'm, I'm putting some extra water in there so we can see that. So it really does just make some incredible <laughs> and really fun just like sandy textures and there's really nothing like it honestly at least in my palette that I carry every day and just the way it moves across the page is so startlingly unique and different so I'm excited to see that kind of dry out and we can watch how that moves but that brings us to a close for our blacks and this dot card does have a Chinese white and a titanium white I'm I don't think those will swatch very well yeah, they're not coming off the page very well, but Chinese white uh, across the board in most paint manufacturers will lean a little bit more toward a little bit more creamy slightly, and titanium white will be a really pure white. Personally, in my palette, I have been using a white gouache from Schminky. That's the one that I, I have found works the best. It's also a titanium white, so probably pretty similar in appearance to the Daniel Smith one. And this one does lift out of my palette pretty well, so that's one reason why I like it. And unlike another one I tried, I tried a titanium white from Windsor & Newton and that one actually never really solidified well enough in the palette. And if it got damp at all, it would just melt and run across my entire palette. So I've been using the Schminky for about a year and a half now as my white gouache in a watercolor kit and really, really enjoying it. And we can also already see some of the granulation happening in that lunar black, so fun. And just for fun, I thought I would swatch out some of the duochrome and the interference colors. So I'm going to start putting a little drop of water on these because I have no idea how hard or easy they are going to be to lift off the page, but we might as well make it as easy as possible on ourselves here. And while those are kind of wetting a little bit on the dot cards, I can explain based on Daniel Smith's little handout here what the difference is between the, dif the different pigments. So according to Daniel Smith, our iridescent colors, those are going to be reflective. So they will kind of bounce back color uh, light like a mirror. Interference paints are refraction. So the particle light enters the paint pigment and then is scattered. And duochrome is a pigment that bounces back between two colors. And then pearlescent adds opalescence like an opal or pearl sheen. And that was information that was just right at the bottom of this thing right down here. <laughs> and again, I personally probably won't use these colors, at least right now. I don't see myself using them in my normal paintings, but they're just fun to play with. So, and a couple of folks requested to see them. So I figured why not? So here's our duochrome oceanic. They have such fun names. I bet these also are really wonderful right out of the tube as well. <laughs> oh, that one, oh, I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but in the little kind of puddle of water, the shiny little pigments are just so pretty. They like sparkle and move around. It looks a lot like the pigment particles that my sister has in one of her inks, um, ink, inks that she's gotten that, that work just like that. Ooh. 
So here's duochrome blue pearl. That's fun. Ooh, so that one, when I put it down, you can really see all the little shiny bits. And if I kind of lean the paper around, you probably can't see them with enough acuity to watch, but the little reflective bits are just sitting in there and looking so pretty. Here's duochrome turquoise. <laughs> Well, all these colors may not be ones that I would use every day. Oh, <laughs> that one's so shiny. <laughs> I wish I had a really powerful camera so you could see that as I, when I swash this across the page, it just makes the most delightful little shiny puddles of pigment. I'm gonna see if I can get some more of a duochrome oceanic on the page and see if it'll do the same. So the oceanic is getting less movement of the little particles everywhere, but it's still quite pretty. And then we get to move our little stuff aside so we can access some more colors. Let's see here. All right, there we go. Now we can see more over here. Get my cup of water back in play too. And my cup of water now has a bunch of little sparkly fun particles too. All right, here's duochrome oh, uh, Cabo Blue. Looks very similar to the last one, honestly. I don't really see much difference, but it's just so shiny. The little shiny particles are so fun to watch move across the page. Woo, so much shine. Okay. Uh, up next is duochrome aquamarine, similar ish to the other one that we already tried, but it's a little bit more with the little reflective particles. Oh, are kind of blue. So this one's really has a dramatic shift kind of from like a bluish to a greenish, which makes sense given that our duochrome will go between two different colors. So this one kind of has a blue and a green shift, which is really fun. And here's our duochrome emerald. Ooh, I just like, I could watch the little pigment particles float around in that puddle all day. <laughs> They're so pretty. <laughs> and I can just watch them move on my page all day. They're just stunning and really fun. And again, I bet these would come out much more saturated uh, out of the tube, but we have so little paint here that we can't get a very strong. This one's shifting between a greenish shiny and like a brownish shiny. Oh, but they're just so fun to watch on the page. <laughs> That's awesome. So I'm really glad I was watching these. They're just, they're very enjoyable. Would I paint with them? Probably not. But are they just fun? Yes. Here's a duochrome saguaro green. That's going to be brown and kind of a yellow color. I don't think I would have called that a green, but sure. <laughs> That's what they want to call it. Go for it. Okay, up next is going to be duochrome adobe. So again, duochrome switches between two different colors. This one really does not want to lift off of my paper at all. I'm gonna get some water going on more of these little guys, see if we can encourage them to, and try not to put too much color in the white ones. See if we can encourage them to lift off a wee bit easier. Boop, 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 okay. So we'll try Adobe again. Adobe, can we work? I'm not sure, it's got kind of a more peachy tone to it. There's our Adobe. Again, it's appearing very, very pale. Here's Autumn Mystery. Ooh, so much shiny. It's like a little snow globe of teeny tiny pigments. That one's kind of fun. Look at that. <laughs> Duochrome Cactus Flower. Ooh, purple and pink kind of shifts happening in this one. That one is not wanting to come off the page at all, so we'll come back to that one. Here's a Hibiscus Duochrome color. It's kind of got a little purple sheen to it. Ooh, so pretty. This one, the little shiny bits really just don't want to get loose. So I bet this one would work really well lifted off of a wet spot of paint. And then, ooh, this one's kind of lifting well, which is nice. Duochrome Violet Pearl, look at that. Ooh, that one's like a shiny purple bonanza. <laughs> I'm enjoying that one. Let's go back to our Duochrome Mauve. That one, oh, there's so little paint. It's so pretty. It's like a kind of purplish greenish color, kind of but it's just, I, there's, there wasn't, I literally like used all the paint pretty much and you can hardly even see it, aw. <laughs> so now we have a ton of different kind of whites and I just don't think these are gonna show it very well on my white piece of paper, like Tropic Sunrise. On my page it has like, if I lean my head side to side, it's kind of like a green shiny and then a more pale white shiny. So I might skip those for now. I'm actually gonna skip down to our pearlescent shimmer. This looks like it has bigger particles yeah, so these don't really want to lift off. And then pearlescent white doesn't really want to do much either for me. So I'm just going to skip those for now. Because <laughs> they won't show up on my page at all. I'm going to slide this over. And I want to go play with some of the iridescent colors. So we're going to get those in view for everybody. There we go. Okay. Oh yeah, I want to play with some iridescent colors. Let's see what happens with these. 
So now let's see. Let's go iridescent moonstone. I also need to get water. I'm trying to put a pretty big water droplet on these to try to encourage them to come off the little page. We'll see if that helps them very much. But I'm cautiously optimistic. At the very least, they're fun to play with. <laughs> All right, iridescent moonstone. Come on, it's your time to shine, literally. It's very shiny. <laughs> what, like the big fluffy kind of shiny particles in there again. Um, these are probably the most easy to see the colors over here on the right. They're just thinning out so much on my page, but here's iridesc iridescent blue, sh blue silver. That one's like so cool. The little particles themselves are just super shiny. That one feels so satisfying to watch when I move my paintbrush. It's mesmerizing. Here's iridescent sunstone. Does not want to lift off, lift off the paper. So come on, little sunstone. Nope, that one doesn't want to go anywhere, but we can enjoy it over here. <laughs> it's kind of like a slightly goldish color. Iridescent Aztec gold. Oh, that one lifted it a little bit better. Look at that. Woo. That one is just like a shimmery, fun puddle of joy over there. <laughs> just love watching that one move over here. It's way more exciting over here on the, on the dot card than on my paper. Iridescent bronze. Come on. Maybe that one. That one's just a slightly more orangish and the gold was slightly more yellowish. Ooh, look at that puddle. <laughs> yeah. So fun. All right, copper. This is even more. Oh, that, this definitely is the one that's lifting off the best. And it has some of the most fun, super shiny particles in there. Ooh. <laughs> oh, if I'm ever having a bad day, I, it would be fun just to have one of these tubes of paint and you could just swirl it around the page and have fun with it because they're just, they're kind of joyful. Look at my cup of water. I don't know if you can see it, but it's just a happy shimmery puddle. Oh, look at that the shimmer in that water cup. It's so fun. Okay. <laughs> if you want to feel like a kid again with a snow globe, get some iridescent colors. <laughs> here's iridescent gold. Definitely the prettiest over here on our little swatch card. Uh, here's iridescent topaz. Um, not very exciting over here or over here. I guess if I get enough of the paint going, it's kind of exciting, but meh, it's okay. Not my most favorite. All right, let's see here. Next up is Iridescent Jade. So let's see how that little friend is going to do. Get everything straightened back out again. All right, here's Iridescent Jade. This one's lifting off okay. It's the most fun over here. It's like a big shiny puddle. This doesn't look that exciting over there. Again, I don't want us to, like, I don't want to judge these colors too hard based on the little amount that the color is coming through because I have so little of the pigment. So I'm definitely looking at the colors over here more on the dot card to see how they would appear in a higher concentration because it just doesn't want to lift off very well. Even with some extra water on top. Iridescent Garnet is just not coming across at all. It's a very pale little puddle. <laughs> Maybe just a couple more over here. Going over to our, trying to get, keep my paper flat. Doesn't want to stay very flat for us. Now we have Iridescent Ruby. Ooh, that's like a, feels like it should be like a makeup color or a lip gloss or something. There's our Iridescent Ruby. <laughs> Iridescent scarab red. Ooh, that's fun. That's cool. And don't forget, iridescent means it'll reflect light from the little particles, and that definitely seems true. Hey, look, one of them actually transferred well to my page. Amazing. Um, iridescent, oh, electric blue. Ooh, I had a little bit of the red left on my brush too, but look at that. That's so fun. Woohoo. <laughs> Ooh, so shiny. It's really fun to move my head side to side and watch all the shiny bits happen. Iridescent Sapphire, what are you going to look like? It's just a slightly more purple version. Does not want to come off the page very well, but man, it's shiny. I have no idea if you can see that, but that is wonderfully shiny. Uh, iridescent Antique Bronze, this looks like a spray paint. <laughs> like someone should be re redecorating a piece of furniture. There we go. Iridescent Antique Copper, I've, I really enjoyed my last copper. So this just looks similar to the other copper, but it's just a little bit more blackish. So I guess they just must have changed the color up a little bit. And here's Antique Gold, which I guess makes sense given the antique name. They want to kind of tone them down a little bit. Antique Gold does not want to come off the page. <laughs> and Antique Silver also is kind of doing its thing, but not really. So, so far, my favorites that were the most fun to play with was our copper right here. Oh, look at that puddle of paint. It's so shiny. Yay. <laughs> and I want you to see my cup of water. So I'm going to change the focus of my camera. Ooh. Look at the shinies in there. 
oh, this is silly, but so fun. Um, I feel like I just want a little cup of shimmery shiny like this on my desk at all the time to watch. I mean, look at that. Whoa, here, let's even see what happens when I start with a paintbrush. It gets really cool. Woo, look at that. <laughs> so much shi fun, shiny things happening in there. <laughs> well, hopefully <laughs> you enjoyed those maybe as much as I did. I'm not sure um, if you had to look at them to see them in their full glory. But the last thing I'll end on is just kind of circling back to the lovely, I'm gonna get this out of the way. Circling back to these lovely colors once they're all dry and we can see the lovely granulation of that lamp, that lunar black as it's almost all the way dry on my page. And then the Payne's gray and then the Payne's blue gray. Oh, and I forgot a little bit more limited uh, color, amount color swatch for this. So let's put that on right now. There we go. A little bit extra shiny happening there. But there we go. So there's those two pigments that we can see. And yeah, overall, a lot of fun. So much, so much fun, shiny shenanigans, basically. But overall, thanks if you've made it this far with me through all the color swatches. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was informative and interesting and hopefully you had some fun along the way as we got to play with all the different colors.